Hello, everyone, and welcome to the recording of the second National Geographic Explorers panel, hosted by the Tech Interactive as a follow-up to our popular first panel. My name is Raul Verma, a rising senior at Mission San Jose High School, and the Director of Outreach and Communications of the Tech Board for Global Good. I had the pleasure of moderating this panel alongside Clarissa Butner from the Tech Interactive. We conversed with National Geographic Explorer Melissa Cronin. Melissa is a PhD candidate at the Conservation Action Lab at UC Santa Cruz, studying ecology and evolutionary biology. Her research focuses on mapping and mitigating marine fisheries bycatch, which is the unwanted fish and other marine creatures caught during commercial fishing for a different species. She shared many details regarding her journey and about her work. One key takeaway was about how we could make a change even during shelter in place, by buying and selecting from certified fisheries that catch fish from only using safe methods. Before I begin the panel, I'd like to acknowledge the Tech Student Board for planning and producing this event as a part of the annual Youth Climate Action Summit presented by NETA. The Tech Student Board, or Tech Board for Global Good, is a branch of the Tech Interactive designed to develop change makers who will tackle and solve some of our planet's toughest challenges. I'd like to thank our sponsors and supporters for making this panel possible, and thank all of you for attending today. Please enjoy the show. I'd like to start with this beautiful video of devil rays because I love this species. This is my favorite species. It's called the monk's devil ray. And you can see them swimming here in this amazing school. I'll just give you a fun fact. This is a small school. And these animals are pretty big. There are four, three feet of cross. They're heavy. They're slippery. I mean, these can get a beautiful, it's beautiful, huge school. So a little background on the monk's devil ray. Anyhow, back to me. <laughs> so uh, I want to emphasize that my background, like many scientists and many conservationists, is not linear. It didn't happen in a straight line, and I didn't certainly know where it was going to be uh, 10 uh, or even five years ago. Um, so like Aurel mentioned, I got a journalism degree at college, and I worked in New York as a freelance and a staff reporter. So I was writing stories, most of them are about environmental issues um, for a bunch of different publications. This, this photo is me, probably at the, the most nervous moment of my entire life, uh, meeting my idol, Jane Goodall. And it was a really fascinating look at all of these environmental issues. I got to go around and interview people and write stories about you know, conservation problems that they were working on. But it became so important to me, conservation became so important to me that I realized that, you know, I actually just wanted to do conservation myself. Luckily, that's a field that you can do. <laughs> so I joined what's called the Conservation Action Lab. It's an academic university lab at uh, the University of California, Santa Cruz. And since then, so that was about four years ago, since then I've been learning how to be a scientist. Um, from these photos, it looks like all I do is swim around and touch manta rays. It's actually a lot of other things, and I'm happy to talk more about that later, but there's a lot of things like learning statistics, uh, learning how to extract DNA. So don't think it's all uh, <laughs> scuba diving every day. And I want to tell you a little bit about what I do, what my research is about. Um, and as we've already mentioned, it's mostly about uh, manta rays and devil rays. This is a photo of a giant oceanic manta ray. This is the largest species of manta ray, and maybe the one that you might have seen before, like on something like Blue Planet, super iconic. I want to give you a little bit of background information about this animal before we move on. So this looks big, right? The diver looks small next to him. Giant oceanic manta rays can reach the weight of a car, a Honda Civic specifically. So if you look at a Honda Civic on the, on the road, this is the same size. They can reach the width, so wing tip to wing tip on each side, that a giraffe is tall. So they're big animals. Sometimes when I'm diving below them, they actually blot out the sun beneath, uh, from, from like being above me. So these are incredible, incredible animals. I can't say that enough. They're also have, they also have these really interesting behaviors and interesting way of living. They're what's called pelagic flyers. So they actually fly through the ocean, just like a bird would above, above ocean. And they're filter feeders like whales. So this is a, a video of a manta ray unfurling what's called its cephalic lobe. That's the little lobe in front of its mouth. 
And what it's gonna do is filter in water, and that water is full of a little delicious plankton. And the plankton, it's opening its mouth, the plankton are gonna get stuck in those little plates inside, and that's its food. This is how it's eating. So this is a, a manta ray feeding right now. And this behavior is brilliant. You know, you can just sort of passively cruise along in the ocean. Uh, you don't spend a lot of energy and you're just constantly eating. It sounds like a great life to me. And I often feel jealous. <laughs> so besides that, uh, mantas have some other really cool characteristics. This is a small devil ray. So mantas and devil rays are actually the same group. I should mention, they're all one big group called mobula. So if you really want to sound kind of sciencey and cool to a marine biologist, use the word mobula, they'll be like, wow. Um, so when I talk about mantas and devil rays, I actually will use that sort of interchangeably, but the correct word is mobula. This is that same species I showed you in the beginning with the giant underwater school. They are also jumpers, as you can see. So they make these fantastic, beautiful ballet-like jumps. Um, they're found mainly in the Gulf of California and Mexico and on the coast of Latin America on the western side. And uh, we don't know why they do these jumps. Uh, nobody has really been able to figure it out. The best guess right now is that they jump to communicate with each other, which I think is totally fantastic. You know, uh, fish of, you know, we, we often don't think of fish as being really communicative, but if these guys are jumping to communicate to say, hey, come over here, there's a lot of fish, or hey, come over here, we're all grouping up together for safety to make a big school. To me, that's really advanced and certainly an animal worth protecting. This is a, a drone fit, uh, photo that I took of those same animals, just to give you a little bit of scale. And again, this is actually a small school, so they can get many, many times this, up in the thousands and even 10,000 individuals at once. Um, but they're fantastic. They're just beautiful to see, beautiful to work with. And this is the species that we work with most. Okay, so that's a bit about mantas and devil rays, uh, mobulas, as you know. I wanna talk now about one of their biggest threats, which is that of fisheries impacts. Um, and so fishing, fishing for any type of uh, fish or seafood can impact marine systems. We call the unintentional capture, so anything that you don't actually mean to capture, we call that bycatch. So when you're trawling, say for shrimp, you're often bycatching stuff like coral, uh, crabs, other species that are on the bottom. When you're fishing, uh, in my case, or in, in what I study, for tuna, you're often bycatching other things, say dolphins, sea turtles, and of course, manta rays and devil rays, mobulas. But, and you might have seen images like this before, one of the big problems in this type of research and bycatch research is that the, the history of, of this type of conservation work has really focused on a small group of species. So sea turtles, we see a lot of them, right? We see the plastic uh, straw band to help sea turtles. And for dolphins, there's actually a whole um, certification. And the next time you look at a tuna can, look for the dolphin safe label. That's a whole uh, realm of conservation. But we've really missed out on uh, I would argue on manta rays and, and similar species. And so the, the fishery that I work with to actually study manta ray bycatch is the, it's called the tuna per seine fishery. Again, it's a little bit of jargon, but if, if you drop this in a conversation with a marine biologist, you're gonna just be totally cool, <laughs> at least my bystanders. So if you've ever eaten a tuna sandwich, it's likely that this is how your tuna was caught. These are huge nets. I cannot emphasize enough. I actually did the math recently. One of these nets all the way stretched out, you actually can't even see it in this photo, is the equivalent to 16 football fields across. So these are big, big nets. And what they do is basically set them all out in a giant circle, and then they cinch them in. On the left-hand side, you can see the cinching process. And then they basically gather all of the tuna into one place and bring it on board a vessel. And this is how we capture about 60% of the world's tuna product. So very likely that uh, you've had something that was fished this way if you're eating tuna. And 
these fisheries uh, cover 91% of the ocean. So this is big money, big industry, and it's quite impactful, as you might imagine. And uh, of course, I'm sure you can guess that they have a lot of manta ray and devil ray mobula bycatch. Um, on the left, this is a photo I took of a small scale fishery in Mexico, which was catching quite a few of that small devil ray, the jumping devil ray, the monk's devil ray. Um, and this is an animal that they caught in their net and that unfortunately died shortly after. Um, on the right hand side, this is an animal in a very, very large scale vessel, an industrial fishing vessel that was way out in the middle of the ocean. And they took a photo of that for me. But I wanna talk about now what we're doing. So this is obviously a huge problem, but there are solutions. And that's what I'm working on for my dissertation. And it all starts from here. So the first thing that we're doing is we're trying to get a little bit of biological information. What I've done is I've actually trained people on board these vessels, so staff that are employed by the fishery, to start taking samples, take little tissue samples. So if you look in this photo, you can see this is a person with scissors. And that little cord that's in his hand is actually the end of the tail of a manta ray that is actually alive on the vessel. Um, luckily, a lot of the mantas will come onto the vessel still alive. And so there is the opportunity to make sure that they get off safely and that the bycatch actually doesn't have an impact on them. But we need to know a lot more about their biological information to be able to actually even say that they're not impacted. So what he's doing is taking a very small tissue sample from the tail. It actually really doesn't hurt them. It's cartilage, so they're mostly fine. Um, and, it's, and their tail can be seven feet long, so they don't miss two centimeters. And he sends that back to me in the lab. So here on the right hand side, you can see pretty much what I'm doing for my uh, dissertation for my graduate work. Um, this is the uh, end result of many weeks of lab work, pipetting, you know, I don't know if you've ever used pipettes in your school, but many very intricate lab works. And we get a drop that is not even the size of your pinky nail. Um, and it's extremely valuable. It's worth quite a lot of money. Uh, and that has 82 manta ray genomes in it. So this is the result of all of this genetic work. And then here on the left, you can see where we've collected these samples from. So this is the uh, coastline of Mexico, Ecuador, Peru. And these mantas are really all over, all over the coastline. And one thing I want to uh, emphasize here is that, you know, normally when we do science, we're so limited by where we can get to. We can only work in coastal areas just because it's so expensive to get way out in the middle of the ocean. But because we work with this fishery to actually collect samples, we've been able to get out into the middle of the ocean. And that is super rare. Um, so there are certain advantages of working with this fishery to try to um, collect these samples. And finally, something that I think is really important in my work and in a lot of conservation work is actually working with people. Uh, it's been very clear to me from years in journalism and also in science that conservation at its core is a human problem. And if we want people to take care of animals and of natural systems, then we need to work with people to make sure that their incentives are aligned to protect spaces or to protect species. We want to make sure that it doesn't make it doesn't uh, mean that they lose money, especially if they rely on something for their job and for their livelihood. We don't want to take that away from them. We actually want to align the incentives so that they are motivated to protect um, the, the animal. And so this is me working with a bunch of um, fisheries observers who are the people who actually go on board the vessels to uh, sort of monitor the catch and fishermen in Ecuador. And this is a specimen of a devil ray that had actually already been um, killed in a, a net. Uh, we certainly didn't kill this. We would never kill an animal for research, um, but a previously dead specimen. And what we did was we brought this animal to their office and we taught them how to do this science. So that's, this is me here, uh, they're taking a lot of video, I think, so they can remember the process, but this is me showing them how to clean the specimen, how to clean the tail, how to cut a very small piece, how to record it, 
We've also uh, taught them how to tag the animals for a different study that we're doing. And we're trying to follow where they go in the ocean. And so this is a really important part of the work where we're really trying to involve them in the process so that they're motivated to help us protect them. This has actually grown into a whole new project where we're working with the fishermen and the owners of the vessels directly to actually change the way that they um, capture manta rays and the way that they release them off the deck so that there's a higher likelihood that the animal will survive. And that's a big deal because if they're catching, you know, many hundreds a year, but 900 or sorry, if they're catching like 500 a year and 499 are living, you know, that's great. That's a huge conservation gain. Um, so we're working with them to try to reduce the mortality and then also to reduce the likelihood that they'll actually catch the animal in the first place. Okay. So that's a, 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 a sort of breakneck speed explanation of my work. I'm so happy to go into it uh, more. Because the theme of this uh, talk is really tech, I just want to highlight some super important, really cool tech that's going on in this field. There's actually quite a lot, and there's a lot of room for new tech development. So a great uh, graduate study project waiting to be done is on fisheries technology. Here on the left, I want to uh, uh, highlight some high tech things that are going on. Um, and this is a, an organization called Global Fishing Watch. If you just type into your Google search uh, box, G Global Fishing Watch, you can get to this awesome interactive website. I encourage you to do it now if you're, if you're there. Um, and you can see records from people fishing on the ocean all over the world. This is amazing. We haven't had this type of data representation until only very recently, like over the past decade. And this is really important because not only can we start to understand the impacts of really intense fishing activity, but we can also start to understand where people are fishing when they shouldn't be. This is crazy important for bycatch, for manta rays and other species that are bycatch, because a lot of bycatch, the majority of bycatch happens in illegal fishing. And so this is a satellite technology that can help us monitor illegal fishing and try to do something about it. You know, we don't want people fishing without recording what they catch and what they bycatch because that makes it almost impossible to do with conservation. So that's high tech. That's one example of high tech. There's quite a lot of other things that I can expand on. On the right is low tech. <laughs> and in many of these fisheries, we're actually much closer to the right side, unfortunately. Um, this is an example of uh, a drawing I actually work with an artist to produce that shows how the manta rays are actually removed from the net. So they use this sort of bucket type of thing to remove the manta ray. What we're doing is trying to develop a grid that goes over that bucket that will basically catch the manta ray and um, keep the manta ray separate from the fish. Super simple, you can make it from a bunch of bungee cords. Um, and that's why it's so useful because fishermen can actually just make it on board with things they might already have or can get from the hardware store. That's still in progress. So we could check in in hopefully a year and I'll have more to report and something to actually show you here. But I wanna note that you know there are really high tech solutions to fisheries. There's also really low tech solutions that are hopefully simple and um, feasible for fishermen, especially fishermen who are really relying on uh, resources and potentially are really low income. Those are some technology. I'm happy to um, go into that more. I also want to just briefly mention what you can do. I, I can imagine that we have some really motivated, awesome people on this call right now who are already really interested in this stuff. So I want to share some options for things you can do to help reduce bycatch and to um, really push for more sustainable ocean systems and fisheries. So the number one thing you can do is to choose sustainable tuna, if you are eating tuna. Um, Greenpeace, the organization, has actually produced a really nice list of sustainable tuna brands. They um, score them on things like bycatch, also things like labor and human rights issues, which are very common in fisheries. So not only are you helping the mantas, but you're also helping people. So these are some brands and I can send out these as a resource. Um, avoid unsustainable brands if you can. 
Uh, and these are some unsustainable brands. Uh, unfortunately, they are the most common brands, so <laughs> it's not great. Um, but you know, we can use our purchasing power, our, our power as consumers to say, no, we don't want to support a tuna fishery that has unsustainable bycatch of endangered species like manta rays. So those are a few things. The second thing is I think you can be really vocal about the type of seafood that you want to put in your body. Um, often when we buy seafood, it's really confusing. There's a lot of different options and they all sort of look the same. <laughs> but I encourage you to push back on that and to be very demanding in the way you buy seafood. And, and if, they, if somebody gets mad at you, just tell them I sent you. That's totally fine. Um, but I'd say if you're at a restaurant or you're at a fish counter especially, I would encourage you to ask your waiter or the restaurant manager or owner, um, you know, where was this caught and how was it caught? And if they don't know it, it's probably a bad sign. Um, you know, like any food, you wanna know where your food is grown. And the more we ask, the better people will become about making sure they know. So if you get an answer, if you do get an answer, a uh, pole in line is generally a good option for tuna and for many fisheries. Um, and then if you're say at a, at a fish counter or sometimes restaurants will have this, looking for a seal of approval, a certification, and you can see here in blue, the Marine Stewardship Council is a good option. Um, so I try to, if I do buy seafood, I try to just buy uh, things that have been certified. There are some things you never know, but um, that's a good place to start. And then finally, if it's available to you, getting local seafood is the way to go. Um, generally, uh, in, in this country at least, we have um, generally sustainable fisheries that have less of the problems that a lot of these other fisheries have, um, both for e ecology, for, for animals, and for people. So if you can get something local, um, that's always better, not to mention you're reducing um, greenhouse gas from shipping. So those are a few things you can do. And then finally, one last um, recommendation is the uh, Seafood Watch program, which has been produced by the Monterey Bay Aquarium. This is a great program. They have an app, which I love. I really don't like uh, looking anything up. I'm, you know, lazy about that. So if you uh, have a phone and you can just download an app, sometimes it makes it way easier. And then you can put in, if you're at the restaurant, you can just put in uh, the type of seafood and it'll tell you if it's a good option, green, if it's an okay option, yellow, and it's a, uh, if it's a red option, which is probably avoid that. Um, so those are some things you can do. Um, before I end, I, I do wanna also suggest that you get involved, um, you know, especially this group of really engaged young people. Uh, there's a lot that you can do in terms of pushing on local and state uh, politicians to push them to support sustainable environmental and specifically fisheries regulations. Um, there's still a lot that we can do in American waters and a lot that we can do to pressure other areas, um, other countries and other you know, ocean areas beyond American waters to enact better seafood policies. So I would say, depends on your state and where you're coming from, but um, get involved with local politics, especially if you live in sort of a coastal area. Okay, uh, that's all for my uh, pre-scheduled spiel. I would be more than happy to discuss this work, um, what it's like to be a Nat Geo explorer and anything else. Uh, so thank you all so much for listening. Great, thank you so much, Melissa. Now, before we transition into a q and I had one short question for you just to Hear about your experience and uh, I wanted to ask you on behalf of our audience and out of my own curiosity what was it like being a woman in the field of marine biology and did you face any challenges in that regard? Yeah um, should I, I should maybe stop sharing my screen I um, yeah that's a great question and a very timely one um, because uh, just this morning I was on a call with some collaborators and I uh, is actually with a bunch of uh, fishing vessel owners. So they're based in Ecuador. Most of them are uh, from Ecuador and they all own tuna vessels. They all operate in the Pacific Ocean. There's maybe 20 of them on this call. 
And I took a, a screenshot of the Zoom call and it's me in the middle and men. <laughs> and I was like, oh, what a sight, wow. Um, and so that's just to say that it is very common to be in fisheries specifically, to be the only woman in the room still. In a lot of conservation, it's actually changed. And there are quite a lot of women in conservation. Um, in some spaces, actually more women in the, than men. And so there, it depends where you are. But I'll say in fisheries specifically, there, it is still a very male dominated field and especially this type of um, fishery. And so, yeah, there have been, you know, real uh, obstacles and barriers to inclusion. One thing is just, um, you know, it's not always uh, comfortable to be the only woman there. There are also things that, you know, just can't access sometimes um, and certain behaviors that are more open to men than are to women, in, in my experience at least. I'll say though that there's a lot of hope and I feel really strongly that the, the field is changing. Um, you know, I have two research assistants who are both women and are both interested in fisheries. I, I know a lot of really uh, brilliant and dedicated and motivated young women who are just about to, you know, take down these fisheries. So there's a lot going on. Um, and it's really hopeful. I, and I think, you know, we can hopefully follow the example that conservation has set in ecology, which has really become a woman dominated field. Um, yeah, and I would just encourage, you know, if there are young women who are listening to this and are interested in the ocean, um, it's a great place to break down some of those barriers. <laughs> we have not fixed it yet. So we need you to come and help us uh, protect ocean animals from these fisheries. <laughs> great, thank you so much. That was fascinating to hear. So we've been having a great conversation so far, but I think it's time we open up to start the chat. We've been seeing some wonderful questions in there and we wanna to get to as many as possible. And everyone, please continue to put the questions in the chat as we're all curious about Melissa's work. I'll pass the mic to Clarissa so she can start leading us through the Q&A. All right, I'll unmute myself then. <laughs> uh, Melissa, it was so interesting to hear about your work and, uh, and all the different ins and outs and intricacies of it. Um, but I think that I imagine, I'll, and a lot of people might share this interest is, how did you get interested in conservation and evolution? How did you get started with that? Yeah, that's funny. Um, so actually, interestingly, uh, well, I hope interestingly, um, I grew up in Maine, uh, Massachusetts and Maine, but Maine was very important for my childhood. And it actually grew up, um, on this very small island. It's called Bailey Island. It was actually just in the news this past week um, because there was a shark attack there, which is totally crazy. We've never had a shark attack in Maine. Um, so if you, if, if you recognize that um, name, that's why. And an odd uh, segue into this shark work. Um, but so I grew up there and um, it's a working fishery. So they, um, have a really vibrant, really lucrative lobster fishery. And it's everything, you know, everything is lobster themed. All of the souvenirs are lobster themed. <laughs> I have a lot of lobster socks. Um, but it was really important, you know, it was really amazing to see how local people really rely on the lobster and on the fishery. And they actually work together really um, carefully in most cases and and really successfully to manage the lobster so that they don't overfish, um, which is often the problem, especially in small fisheries. It's easy to overfish them. And Maine has really done a good job about managing the lobster fishery for the most part. Um, so that was really cool and got me super interested in, you know, resources and how people interact with the natural environment and how we can take care of it and, and not destroy it. Um, so that was sort of the background. And then I was covering, um, I was reporting on, you know, conservation issues. And specifically, I was writing a bunch of stories about shark finning. And every, I hope people know about shark finning, it's such a destructive practice and causes really big problems for endangered shark species. And I was covering these um, shark, fin shark finning shipments in, in commercial planes. 
So people might not know, but a lot of big airlines actually still do ship shark fin. And I, I think including UPS, I, I believe you'll have to fact check me on that, but there's a lot of large like brand names that still uh, help people shark fin. And so I was covering that system and I thought, wow, this is just so awful. How, you know, how do we have this in the society? And I thought, I, I actually just want to, like I said, I actually just want to work on this. I want to, you know, try to stop that from happening, this, this um, destructive fishing practices. And so I really did have like a 180 and I applied to grad school. I was really lucky to get into where I am now, extremely lucky. Um, and here I am. And I'll say one thing is that if there are folks, uh, people out there are students who are, um, uh, you know, in a writing program or in a program that's not science, please know that writing skills are incredibly valuable in science and that not everybody always has them in scientific fields or in conservation. And if you're doing, if you're studying something that's not related to conservation, that's okay. You can get into it. Um, and, and there's lots of different, you know, ways to do so. That was great to hear. And you mentioned that you started off in conservation before moving to marine biology. And you did mention also that your writing was very important for you when you entered your sciences. So could you kind of expand on how that writing helped you out there? Yeah, yeah. It's funny. I really thought that when I transitioned from journalism to science, I thought, oh, God, my skills are going to be useless and I have to relearn everything and I have to, you know, start from ground zero. Uh, I did have to relearn a lot of things, a lot of terms, a lot of stats, um, a lot of, you know, ecological concepts. But writing is so important in every field. I can't emphasize that enough. I'm sure I sound like an annoying English teacher, but it really did help me. Um, you know, uh, I, I just saw some comment in the, in the chat. Do you see cute animals? Sometimes, but a lot of the time you're writing or doing data analysis, collecting data. Um, and I think if you, if you really wanna do conservation, you wanna save species, you're gonna have to be a good communicator. So that means really learning how to um, put ideas together and communicate them like this, you know, orally, uh, but in written ways, a lot of the stuff we do is writing grants, writing research papers. And um, if you're interested in this type of academic, you know, like university conservation um, field, it's, it's writing heavy. And then, I mean, just even beyond that is that people really respond to science communication, whether that's writing, whether that's film, whether that's photography, um, so having these other skills is so important if we want to protect these um, threatened and endangered species. Uh, so we have a, a couple people who are interested in the chat about um, a little bit more of the education background that it takes to go into conservation and to go into marine biology. Could you tell us a little bit about your experience in that? Yes. Um, yes, sure. So I had actually a double major in environmental studies in my undergrad. I went to New York University. And so I took a couple ecology classes. I would say that the people that I'm in grad school now with and the people that I consider colleagues, generally in undergrad, they took things like ecology, evolutionary biology, genetics, um, statistics, is my least favorite subject, but is extremely important for this type of science. I, I'll caution that by saying that there is conservation work that involves no science and is extremely important. There's marketing, there's art, there's you know journalism. So not everybody has to do science to do conservation, certainly, but it is one type of doing conservation. <laughs> Anyways, uh, back to the courses. Um, Things like, you know, if your university offers a marine biology course, of course, that's a great way to get into marine biology. Uh, field courses, which is where you go out and actually learn how to collect data in the field. Those can be really uh, fun and fascinating. So if your university offers that, that's a great way to get um, experience. There's also the National Science Foundation has a um, REU, Research Experience for Undergrad. Um, uh, program. So if you're in college or looking towards college, I would look that up and try to see um, if you can get involved in that. Amazing experiences. 
Um, in terms of, you know, courses that I think are most valuable, I would say biology, ecology, that's kind of the bread and butter that you want to get. If you're interested in this type of academic, you know, science uh, conservation, if you're interested in something like, I want to do communication about conservation, then you can do what I did, which is um, study journalism and cover uh, environmental issues. So there's a lot of different ways of coming at it, uh, but I hope that helps a little bit. Awesome, very cool. Um, very useful information. It's always good to get that kind of thing from an expert or someone experienced in the field at least. Um, so we're actually going to be coming to the end of our Q&A. Um, so we're just going to end on, uh, can you give us a few words of advice, either about your field or about finding your passion or about whatever you feel like giving us a piece of advice about right now. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. Well, I, I would say that, um, you know, I guess I've been uh, sort of circling around it, but I really think there are so many different ways to think about protecting the natural world and the endangered species that live in it and the people who rely on natural systems. And, you know, conservation biology is one of them. There are many, and I encourage folks to really find something that they're good at, that they love. You know, if you're interested in saving species, you can be an artist and you can do this like really beautiful, breathtaking art that shows us why, or why we should protect elephants from poaching or why we should protect manta rays from fisheries. Um, I actually even work with an artist who's helping me do that. You can be a communicator, you can be a scientist. So I, I would encourage folks, especially those who are maybe not interested in science, um, to find a way to use your talents uh, for things like the natural world. Of course, I want people to go towards that, um, but there's many other problems out there. That's one thing. And then I'd like to just, uh, Again, I'm a really good example for somebody who changed uh, careers at 25 years old, um, which now doesn't sound that old, but I thought it was. But it's just to say that um, I think it's really possible to think you're going to do one thing and then totally change it. Um, and you can, you can you know, really carve out your path. All of the amazing uh, scientists and conservationists that I know had a really winding path to where they are now. And I think that's super important for young people to know because um, it's not all a straight line and there's a whole lot of ways to get into your dream career for sure. And a whole lot of ways to be a, a Nat Geo explorer because we're certainly not all marine biologists, that's for sure. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much, Melissa. And thank you so much, chat, for all the wonderful questions. So sorry if we didn't get to yours in this short session. I wish it could be a lot longer. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and pass it back over to a rule for a few wrap ups and calls to actions before we end our webinar. Great. Thank you so much, Clarissa and Melissa, for that wonderful talk. It was a pleasure talking to you and listening to you. And just before we wrap up, I just wanted to talk to the audience for a little bit. And thank you so much for coming today. A uh, short recap on what you can do to make a difference. Don't forget that it's better to always take sustainable seafood and make an op take the opportunity to eat sustainable seafood in order to make your own difference at your own homes and make your own impact. And all high school students on the call, you really want to be a part of our next event. You can't just you don't just have to make an impact from eating seafood. You can also make your own impact this August when we'll be hosting a leadership lab where you can create and present innovative solutions to the problem of ocean plastics. I'd also urge you to follow the Tech Interactive on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, where you can find more information on the upcoming events. And once again, I'd like to give thanks to all of our wonderful sponsors who made this event possible, and to Melissa. Thank you for being such a wonderful presence and being the one who made this panel possible and great. And once and for all, finally, Thank you to our lovely audience. Thank you for supporting us and making this panel discussion lively and entertaining.